Good morning, Acting Justice uh, Bill Sheets. Morning, Chief Justice Sondo. How are you this morning? Uh, I am a little nervous, uh, <laughs> but I am also <laughs> deeply honored to have had the opportunity to act at the Constitutional Court. I'm deeply grateful to you, the Minister of Justice and the President for that opportunity and to be able to be present at yeah. this uh, uh, august hearing today. And uh, how are you, Chief Justice? Well, uh, I'm fine. <laughs> Yeah. I'm fine, and I think I speak on behalf of all the commissioners, too, when I say they are also fine. Glad to hear that. Thank you very much uh, for availing yourself uh, for this interview. Uh, I just want to mention that uh, Acting Justice Pilches is a professor of law, of constitutional law at the University of Johannesburg, but is currently acting as a justice in the Constitutional Court, having started uh, at the beginning of February. Uh, he is still uh, act, acting there. Maybe I should just uh, explain a few things for the benefit of everybody. Um, it is the first time in many years that uh, we, this body interviews um, uh, an academic uh, for a position in the Constitutional Court. It, had, it hasn't happened in many, many years. So um, Professor Pilchitz is therefore making history being the first one after so many years. Um, uh, this, of course, as uh, all commissioners would know, happened as a result of a decision that was taken last year to uh, open the pool up to senior practitioners and um, uh, academics to be given acting appointments on the Constitutional Court um, so that uh, they could make themselves available for consideration for appointment to that court. So uh, Professor Pilchitz is uh, one of uh, the, actually is the first academic who will made himself available for that. And uh, we thank you uh, for availing yourself. Thank you, Chief Justice. It is a great honor to yes. even be considered for this position. Yes. We, I am going to ask you questions. And after I've finished asking you questions, then uh, the uh, minister will also ask you questions and the President of the Supreme Court of Appeal um, and uh, other commissioners who might have questions to put to you will also do so. In asking you whatever questions we are going to ask you, we are going to bear in mind the selection criteria that this body has previously decided um, would guide it in selecting uh, candidates for appointment. Everybody who is here is just here to try to do the best they can to make sure that uh, uh, the selection process goes properly and fairly. There is nobody who is here to try and humiliate any candidate. Some of the questions might be tough, but that doesn't necessarily mean that uh, anybody uh, seeks to uh, humiliate any candidates. So we will ask you questions that uh, really are aimed at uh, seeing how you satisfy the various uh, 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 selection criteria. You, you understand? Yes, thanks, Chief Justice. Yes, okay, all right. Now, 
I've already said that you are a professor of constitutional law at the University of Johannesburg, but you studied at the University of Veterans many years ago, where you obtained your BA, BA honors and LLB, is that correct? Yes, Chief Justice. In fact, uh, I started my studies with the advent of the new South Africa. And so it was an extraordinarily exciting time to yes. be studying law where yes. the first judgments of the Constitutional Court were coming out. Yes, yes. And um, after you had uh, obtained those three degrees, you proceeded to the University of Cambridge, where you obtained your MPhil and PhD, is that correct? That is correct. I did in between, I clerked at the Constitutional Court for uh, then a Deputy Judge President Langer, who became Chief Justice, as we know, and that was a seminal experience of mine and a great privilege to learn from uh, Justice Langer uh, and to really experience what the greatness that he exuded uh, the humility, uh, the tremendous sense of commitment to social justice. And he has had a huge influence on my life and, in fact, encouraged me to pursue my postgraduate studies. When I was after a very difficult master's year, I was debating whether to come back and to go into legal practice. I wasn't entirely sure where to go. And Justice Langer said to me, David, take your time, study you will come back with more knowledge, more understanding, and you'll be able to help South Africa more rather than stopping at this point. And that led me to continue my PhD and, and graduate with that, which led to my first book. Yes, I, I take it that you don't intend to demote him. Uh, he was Deputy President of the Constitutional Court, not Deputy Judge President. <laughs> <laughs> Apologies. <laughs> of course not. <laughs> uh, how long did you clerk at the Constitutional Court? Was it one year at that time, or was it a different period? Almost a year, Chief Justice, around nine months. Um, because of my, uh, I received a scholarship to study overseas, and uh, Justice Langer said that I should go and study and uh, not delay that. So um, he was very kindly released me from the last three months. Yes. And um, you, after finishing your PhD, you did a lecture part time at, uh, was it at Vets or Pretoria? At the University of the Witwatersrand, right? yes. mainly in the area of jurisprudence and philosophy of law. Yes. Uh, just to go back to the time when you did your uh, first three degrees. It was 1996, that's when you got your BA, and then your BA honors was 1997, and then your MPhil was 19, no, no, I'm sorry. Yeah, BA honors was 1997, LLP was 1999, MPhil was 2001, and PhD was 2004. That's correct, Chief Justice. So you, to get to the PhD, you studied uh, for about uh, 10 years if you start from BA. That is correct, yes. Yes. A long period of study. <laughs> so, so altogether, you, you hold five degrees. Yes. Yes. Okay. Now, when you were at the Constitutional Court, how did you find the experience of clerking uh, at the Constitutional Court and how much did that experience help you in maybe deciding what you may have wanted, what you may have done for your doctoral thesis? It was a seminal experience, Chief Justice, and I think one of the major contributions that the Constitutional Court has made is in the clerkship program, in nurturing lawyers who come out of a university or perhaps a postgraduate degree, giving them experience of some of the most complex issues in our constitutional order, and then they have the opportunity to go into practice and actually, I think, generally imbibe a commitment to social justice from that experience. And um, my experience, it was an extraordinary coming out of law school and coming into the highest court of the land with some of the most exciting issues. And in fact, um, one of the cases that we engaged with was the Khrutboom case, which of course is a seminal case 
in the history of South African jurisprudence around socioeconomic rights. And that case, because I wasn't exactly entirely happy with what the court did in that case, uh, I, that led me to further studies in both my master's and my doctorate. And it led to my first book in poverty and fundamental rights, giving expression to both a critique of what the constitutional court was doing, uh, but also trying to provide an alternative approach that I would give better expression to socioeconomic rights in my view. And so, as you can see, having been at the court gave me a real sense of one of the critical gaps in both academic literature as well as jurisprudence worldwide. And that led me in a certain direction around my academic career. No, thank you. Um, but you also, you went and did articles uh, in a law firm, is that correct? That's correct, Chief Justice. I wasn't entirely sure. I, was, I, I had been studying, as you say, for a long time, for 10 years, and I kind of felt law had a, a practical element to it. And I wanted to experience that practical dimension. I wanted to see uh, law in action in many ways. And so, but I also wanted to combine it with my interests in relation to uh, addressing the serious legacy of poverty in our country and so I, I went to a law firm that did a lot of work with the government uh, and that did a lot of work about expanding services across the country, uh, particularly in water, sanitation, etc. cetera. Um, and so it was, a, a, it was a wonderful eye. On the one hand, I got legal experience. I, did one, I was given the opportunity to go to court. I, I applied for a protection order for someone who was subject to domestic violence. I also ran a... Uh, a defense in a criminal trial uh, at the time uh, during my uh, in the magistrate's court of course um, but um, I, and so getting some practical experience in the courts uh, whilst at the same time doing a lot of other work such as contractual work uh, etc uh, in a sense work legal work surrounding uh, the giving effect to uh, a, a, a decent governance across the country. And so it was, a, it was a wonderful experience to move from a very, let's say, often theoretical, deep engagement with theory to a very concrete practice. And then in 2007, I got the offer just as my book was about to come out uh, to return to academia. And I decided that I, 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 I wanted to give more thought to some of the issues that I'd seen in practice. And, and, and return to writing and research. And uh, you were subsequently, as you say, um, appointed uh, at uh, the University of Johannesburg, is that correct, initially as an associate professor? So I initially began in, in, in an in institute set up by um, Justice Ackerman from the Constitutional Court, which was really recognized the importance of deep academic work um, for the advancement of the constitutional project in South Africa, the South African Institute for Advanced Constitutional, Public, Human Rights and International Law, a very long name, which we now just say is SIFAC. Mm -hmm. And then I became the director in 2009. And um, the University of Johannesburg, uh, in a sense, there was a merger of SIFAC with the University of Johannesburg. And so I joined the University of Johannesburg then, both as director of SIFAC, which I remain, and as uh, an associate professor uh, initially, and then I, a few years later, I became a professor. Well, um, your PhD was um, in uh, socioeconomic rights, is that correct? That is correct. What was the title of your thesis? Giving priority to the worst off, the justification and enforcement of socioeconomic rights. Hmm. Uh, do you want to take two minutes to share with this commission what is important uh, about your thesis in relation to social economic rights in South Africa? Thank you, Chief Justice. Um, the, the thesis also became a book which is widely available, Poverty and Fundamental Rights, with a few changes. Um, there are two components to the book. The first is a philosophical element of the book which attempts to look at what is the deeper underpinning of fundamental rights. And one of the important aspects that I try and defend is that socioeconomic rights are no less fundamental than civil and political rights. There's a long overhang in the tradition around rights, which seeks to place rights around freedom rights, should we call them, 
as central as the central most important rights. And I try and show why rights relating to the resources that individuals can have access to are no less fundamental than freedom rights. They're absolutely essential and universally that is a matter that is applicable. I then go in in the second part of the book to look at the approach adopted by the Constitutional Court, which has very much focused on the idea of reasonableness, uh, taking its, 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 uh, its inspiration from section 26.2 and 27.2. And I argue that the approach of the court actually fails properly to give effect to the underlying justification of rights. So there's the connection between the two parts. And that actually socioeconomic rights, we need to spend more time thinking about what entitlements do they give to South Africans? and where they exist to Colombians and Indians and other part, people in other parts of the world. What entitlements do they give? And one of the difficulties that we face as a country in South Africa, for instance, is we are resource constrained. So how do we deal with a situation where we have rights and claims that individuals have to ensure to adequate housing, to access to health services, to sufficient food and water? How do we deal with that in a context where we can't meet all those rights immediately. And the, the book argues for an approach based on, but developing the approach adopted at the international level uh, by the Committee on Economic, Social and Cultural Rights called the minimum core approach, which requires that the government prioritize a minimum level of access to rights with a duty afterwards to progressively realize those rights uh, over time to achieve a more adequate level of fulfillment of those rights. And so that's a relatively short encapsulation of quite a, a complex argument, but I hope it gives commissioners a sense of what, what I sought to argue in the book. Yes, and uh, you have uh, written numerous articles that have been published on particularly the subject of socioeconomic rights, is that correct? Yes, Chief Justice. Uh, do you, are you able to say about how many articles that you have written have been published in uh, uh, journals and so on? Uh, Chief Justice, I think it's about, uh, I had it in my, in, in my documents, I think it's about 41 journal articles. Yes, you don't have to be accurate, just an indication because it is in the in the bundle. In, in the bundle and it's <laughs> about 27 book chapters. I think it's two monographs, which is sole authored books and five edited collections. I think that's, that's, that's the correct number. Yes, yes, I was still going to come to that. So how many books have you written chapters in? Uh, I, th I think it's 27, Chief Justice. 27 books. Yeah. And um, where your contributions in all 27 books on socioeconomic rights or were they on socioeconomic rights and other topics under constitutional law? A range of other topics, Chief Justice. I haven't only focused on socioeconomic rights. One of my I would say my, uh, in general, if I want to capture what my focus has been, I like to always say that the questions I've dealt with is uh, in relation to rights is who must do what for whom. Um, we always have to ask that, those questions when we're dealing with rights and who is the question of who has the obligations. And um, one of the issues that I've tried to focus on is to move beyond simply the state but to actually argue, and I've spent a lot of time looking at the obligations of businesses and corporations specifically in relation to fundamental rights, and that was in fact the subject of my second book. Um, so that was the who question, what is the question of, what is the content, what must we do? What do rights give one an entitlement to? What are the claims that, that they make, uh, that individuals can make, and what are the obligations they impose? And the last part relates to, to whom, who are the beneficiaries of the rights um, and looking there particularly at vulnerable groups, people with psychosocial disabilities or in more common parlance, mental illnesses. I've written a paper in relation to that. 
the LGBTQ community, what rights can be claimed, etc. And we know we've made lots of progress in South Africa in that regard. And then I've also challenged the notion that rights can necessarily only be restricted to the domain of the human and what rights can be claimed by creatures who are not human or other parts of the environment as well. So that roughly, I hope, gives some kind of sense of the, the range of topics that I've sought to cover, as well as more theoretical topics about, for instance, the proportionality test of when we limit rights. And one of my chapters, the necessity uh, and proportionality chapter that I've referred to has been influential in affecting, in fact, the Indian Supreme Court's approach to um, the limitation of rights and the necessity test. Um, one is uh, the effect is, is the position also that uh, one of your writings has influenced the, uh, is it the Constitutional Court of Peru? Yes, Chief Justice, the Constitutional Court, my work on socioeconomic rights, uh, to some extent has been very successful in, in Latin America with their approaches towards uh, socioeconomic rights and a more individualized approach in some ways. And so the Constitutional Court of Peru has used my work as support for the minimum core approach, as well as the Constitutional Court of Mexico. And in fact, I've also been invited because of my work, I, I did a whole course for a, a judicial training institute in Mexico uh, around socioeconomic rights, which was seen by thousands of judges there. And um, uh... To what extent has, uh, have the courts in South Africa, including the Constitutional Court, uh, also relied on some of your writings? Uh, Chief Justice, I've, I, I've put in my um, application, there's I think about seven citations to my writings in different courts. Mm. Uh, the um, Constitutional Court has, to some extent, engaged with my writing, on the one hand, to distinguish its approach. So in the Mazibuko case, in a way, it referenced me as the alternative approach to which it's not following. But in, in another case, for example, the Makana case, uh, it, it, it referenced, although it wasn't the core issue around the case, but it referenced my article in relation to uh, dignity and the rights of people with psychosocial disabilities with, with approval uh, that we can't always assert that individuals in such circumstances have legal capacity. Um, and most recently, uh, a, a case note uh, that I co-authored with Professor Ziegler uh, was um, what was referred to with approval and seemed to influence uh, perhaps the judgment of the Supreme Court of Appeal in relation to the constitutionality of a provision which denied South African uh, citizenship who acquired other citizenships abroad without the permission of the minister. So uh, I have had uh, several uh, cases where the um, the, my writings have been influential in the courts. Now, you have not had any practical experience in the practice of law uh, as an attorney or advocate uh, other than the fact that you, you served articles for two years. Is that correct? Yes, I have uh, not after that, I did not really practice other than perhaps I was asked as an academic to provide some advice on whether cases uh, and I've, yeah. I've helped in some ways brew some litigation yes. uh, to to but I haven't acted as an attorney in yes. those in those litigious yeah. matters. Um, that means uh, and you also haven't sat as uh, an arbitrator in any disputes. Is that correct? Uh, I have not, Chief Justice. Yes. Um, the acting stint that you have been afforded in the Constitutional Court uh, in, uh, fev from February this year is your, fact, your first acting stint in any court, is that right? That is correct. Yes. Now, in the, uh, as an academic, it's quite clear that you have <coughs> written very extensively uh, on the subjects uh, uh, that you have written on. What do you say to anybody who might think that the fact that you didn't practice as an attorney or advocate 
and didn't sit as an arbitrator. Uh, uh, what would you say to somebody who says those uh, factors <coughs> uh, uh, count against you? Well, what would you say to somebody who says that? Chief Justice, that is not my experience, of course, but I think the starting point for me is section 1745 of the Constitution, which says that at all times, the Constitutional Court must be made up of at least four people who were judges, uh, former judges, and that recognizes the importance of prior judicial experience. But I think it also, importantly, opens the door for people with a different form of experience to join the Constitutional Court. And so people coming from the advocates profession, the attorneys profession and judges have invaluable experience to bring to the constitutional court. The experience of an academic is a different form of experience. And the question I suppose very much for this commission will be, is that experience of the academic something that one regards as important that can diversify the range of experience and the range of thinking that is open to um, the Constitutional Court. And I, I would just like to suggest to you some aspects that academia, uh, 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 that is characteristic of academic thinking. The first is perhaps a type of a, a breadth of perspective, an exposure to a range of different influences, a range of different systems, different constitutional cultures. And in fact, our constitution, it seems to me, is an outward looking constitution. We're expressly required when interpreting the Bill of Rights to take account of international law and to consider foreign case law. And so it seems to me that those kinds of interactions that someone like myself has had with both global north and global south systems can bring an important perspective to the work of the court. I think we also as academics engage all the time with young people and that challenges uh, an academic, uh, of course, you start off as a relatively young academic, you become, I suppose, I'm middle aged, and then you become a more experienced academic. And all the time you're interacting with people with different ways of seeing the world. And that is also challenging and brings a particular realm of experience to the court. And the last point I'd like to make is I suppose there's a degree of depth of engagement. The academic skill is very much about, as I mentioned when I was describing my book, I didn't just start with legal doctrine. I went all the way back to thinking about what are the underpinnings of fundamental rights? How does socioeconomic rights relate to civil and political rights? And then what implications does that have for legal doctrine? And so it seems to me that that ability to go and have a sense of what those deeper underlying questions, those deeper perhaps philosophical ones, after which involve years of research and reflection, can aid the court and bring another, again, another form of experience to the court's work. Um, and I think that I would argue that's particularly important for the apex court, where understanding deeper questions of political philosophy understanding deeper questions of what rights are there for, what is our constitution there to do, and the deeper, we've also got now general jurisdiction as a constitutional court, what are the deeper underlying principles of the law? These are all important skills that I think can contribute to the work of the court. Now, during your time as an academic, um, where the branches of law in which you have published and taught uh, constitutional law, human rights law, administrative law uh, only, or did you go beyond that in branches like such as commercial law, law of contract, delict, jurisprudence? Did you get to right on those other branches of law or teach on those other branches of law as well. And I ask this in the light of the general jurisdiction of the court that you just mentioned. Absolutely, Chief Justice. Um, my general expertise is constitutional expertise, but importantly, constitutional expertise influences and has an effect on all areas of law. And I think we still have a long way to go of seeing the all the other areas of law through the prism 
of the Constitution. We know Section 39.2 requires, when interpreting legislation or developing the common law, customary law, to have regard to the spirit, purport, and object of the Bill of Rights. And my experience already on the Constitutional Court has shown me that even cases that seem to be purely commercial cases actually raise questions about uh, the spirit, purport, and objects of the Bill of Rights. Now, my experience has actually seen everything through the prism of the Constitution, but it hasn't only been related to areas of public law. And that's because when I started going into issues of business and human rights, I realized very soon that we couldn't just think of this from a matter of human rights perspective. We also have to think, for instance, of company law. How does company law shift in light of the imperative that businesses respect fundamental rights? And so, for example, in my recent book, I have a chapter on how company law needs to change. Doctrines such as the fiduciary duty of directors, heavily, in, 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 really core elements of company law, the business judgment rule, very different elements, the social and ethics committee, all these different areas, the derivative action, all these different elements. How does the constitution impact on those areas and how does our engagement with fundamental rights impact on those areas? So I would suggest to you, while I would not claim to be an expert in all areas of law, which I think is impossible for anyone to claim that, uh, I have had a engagement, particularly in areas such as company law, uh, with um, commercial law. And, uh, I, I, and, and, and my commitment would be to try and infuse the values of our constitution uh, into the full panoply of law in South Africa so that we really give expression to that idea that we have one legal system that is ultimately grounded in our constitution and its values. Thank you. You started acting in the Constitutional Court at the beginning of February. Share with the commissioners what experience or feeling you had coming back to the court where you clerked so many years ago, now coming as an acting justice. I would say to you, uh, Chief Justice, there was a degree of spine tingling uh, sensation uh, it's, I think, a, a, a dream of every uh, law clerk to one day be a judge, but I never have expected that to happen. I know that the, the emphasis in our country was against academics being a judge, so I never expected ever for that to happen. So when I entered the, the, the beautiful building of the court, which so gives expression to the values of the Constitution, it was... Uh, a, a, a really a, an, an extraordinary experience and a humbling one and a great, in a way, fulfillment of a, of a dream to me uh, to come there and then to be embraced by the wonderful collegiality of the colleagues at the Constitutional Court uh, to, of course, there is a learning curve into the systems of the court and to be shown and to be guided in that way it has been an extraordinary experience. And also one I would suggest that also has benefits if my candidacy goes no further, I will have a deeper experience on understanding of what it is like to be a judge. And I think that is also a great benefit of having academics on the court, that there is, an, some, uh, there is a deeper sense of the constraints of judging as well as uh, the pressures and what it is to be a judge. Uh, and so I, I really forever will value this extraordinary opportunity. And then of course, uh, what about the first day you walked into the courtroom with all the other justices for the first time and not sitting where the law clerks sit, now sitting as one of the justices? Chief Justice, I had to pinch myself a little bit. Uh, I was quite nervous, and I think, uh, as people will know, I uh, also um, I, 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 I always prepare very well. But for that first hearing, one had to be beyond super prepared because I was, uh, you know, I was like, well, this is this is the first one, uh, and so uh, it was it was a, a, an extraordinary moment to wear the robes and 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 to assume this 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 high office, this, this sense that the people of South Africa have entrusted us with 
the guardianship of the constitution which brings all the people of our country together with a vision of a different type of future, a recognition of an extraordinarily painful past and filled with injustice, but a movement towards a more democratic, egalitarian, free future that improves the lives of every single South African. And that is the sense of responsibility that I felt as I entered that courtroom. And uh, share with the commissioners the experience you have had uh, of acting and interacting with the justices of the court over the past uh, uh, two, two months, February and March, uh, how you found it and uh, how you found interacting with the justices and uh, how you found the work to be. Thank you, Chief Justice. There, it was, as I've already mentioned, an extreme generosity. I really felt and experienced the African value in, of Ubuntu in action, uh, of people caring and trying to make me a part of uh, the court. Um, I also, as, as might come up, I, I relatively early on disagreed with uh, some colleagues. Uh, it's a matter of public record now on the Rivonia Circle case. And what was fascinating to me and extraordinary was the approach to disagreement. It wasn't that we were antagonists. We had differences of view. And in fact, my colleagues who disagreed most strongly with me tried to help improve the reasons I gave and vice versa. And that seemed to me an extraordinary culture where we embrace and recognize we may not all have the same point of view, but we try and make each other's point of view and expression of opinions the best that it can be. And that is a tremendous culture that exists at the Constitutional Court. Um, as you mentioned, I think the case, it, 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 I'm a very busy academic involved in many, many different facets, but I found the workload at the Constitutional Court uh, was ma absolutely massive uh, increase. Uh, there is a huge number of new applications which we continue to have to con consider the degree of preparation for every single hearing, uh, the consideration of the issues that come before the court is, involves a really deep engagement. And so I have the most tremendous respect for all the judges that are working under this continued pressure of uh, a, a massive caseload uh, and, and, and uh, trying to advance in the best way they can uh, justice for our country. Uh, you were not able to favor the this commission with uh, a copy of any judgment that you have uh, written during your acting stint, is that correct? Yes, Chief Justice, it is a degree unfortunate. Um, I, I, am, uh, I only started acting in February, so it is only two months. Uh, mm -hmm. I did work very hard on trying to have a judgment ready for this commission, mm -hmm. but the Constitutional Court is a complicated court in terms of just rushing out judgments. It is the authoritative word on matters that come before the court. And as a result, there's a degree of care and caution that needs to go into the preparation of judgments. And so even if a matter is unanimous, there is a range of matters one has to take into account the range of perspectives that come into a decision. And if it's not unanimous, one needs to have an opportunity for different uh, d decisions to be prepared. And so whilst I cannot comment on exactly uh, the, the particular case uh, that happened, there was a real effort on my part to, make, to, to achieve that, but the need for care around only issuing a judgment once everyone is satisfied with that meant it was not possible to have one ready for the commission to inspect. Well, I can confirm that uh, you really worked hard to try and uh, have it ready before your interviews, but uh, uh, the dynamics were such that uh, uh, ultimately it shouldn't be rushed too much. Uh, so uh, <clears throat> uh, it's 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 not ideal, but uh, you did all you all you could. Now you are going to continue acting in the second uh, term is that right in may 
Yes, Chief Justice. I am still currently a sitting judge of the court for yeah. April and May. Yes, yes. <clears throat> now, let's talk about uh, other matters relating to the adjudication of cases. Uh, some of the questions I might put to you, uh, it might be questions that uh, maybe somebody who has uh, had the benefit of practical practice might uh, uh, remember easily, I'm not sure, but I think that even an academic, they would uh, be aware of the principles and so on. When you are dealing with a matter where the constitutional court, you are sitting in the constitutional court, uh, you have concluded that a certain piece of legislation or a provision in legislation is constitutionally invalid and that you are going to have to make that order. What other issues should come immediately to your mind that are related to what else you might have to look at when you make that order? Thanks, Chief Justice. I mean, this implicates Section 1721 of the Constitution. And of course, the first thing, if some, a matter is required to uh, be declared unconstitutional, then uh, one, if it is found to be unconstitutional, it must be declared to be unconstitutional to the extent of its inconsistency. So that's the first question one has to look at. Uh, one, one wouldn't declare a whole statute invalid if only one part of the statute is um, is, is uh, uh, not uh, constitutional. The second part requires one to um, make any order that is just and equitable. Um, and uh, that requires a wide ranging discretion and some parts of that in relation to the dec declaration, there's a question for instance of does one make the order retrospective or only prospective? Uh, uh, does one suspend the invalidity of the order? You could create for instance a major gap in the legislative uh, system if you if you simply declared a matter unconstitutional uh, and leave uh, a, a hole which which actually can't it, it, it's not acceptable to do so uh, and causes all kinds of harm to the administration of justice so you may you may want to suspend sometimes uh, uh, the um, invalidity and give Parliament an opportunity to correct. Uh, for that, and the court has done that on many different occasions uh, in relation to uh, suspension of declarations of invalidity. Um, there are, of course, a range of different issues that relate to the order itself. Uh, you want to do justice to the parties. The Constitutional Court is also concerned not only with the parties, but the wider community as well. It needs to consider those kinds of questions. Uh, it may be that you declare something invalid, but people operated on the assumption that it was valid. And therefore, uh, uh, you need it would be completely unfair, uh, for instance, uh, not to uh, provide some compensation in certain circumstances for where people had operated on that basis. Uh, so those are perhaps some of the factors that would come in uh, to thinking about uh, remedial relief. Uh, and also perhaps like in areas which I'm expert on, socioeconomic rights, we would sometimes think about uh, how practically to give effect to an order might require a continued backwards and forwards uh, uh, process between the court and the branch of government concerned, such as structural interdicts, etc. So um, I hope that, that that to some extent answers your question. Yes. And uh, when do you use reading in and when do you use reading down? Uh, reading down will be when uh, we can interpret the Constitution. It relates to 39.2. Um, when we can interpret the Constitution, uh, the, the provision in question, sorry, uh, of, a, of a statute in a way that is in conformity with the Constitution itself. And um, the court has laid out a range of principles. In fact, one of the cases was one I worked on when I was a law clerk uh, with Justice Langer, uh, the Hyundai case, where there was a question of how far can you stretch the language of a provision 
uh, to make it consistent with the Constitution. That will be a judgment call that the court has to make of whether it can read it in conformity with the Constitution. Uh, reading in is a different remedy. It involves when one has, in fact, um, declared a matter unconstitutional. Uh, but then, uh, generally, the court, again, another factor we need to bear in mind as well when issuing remedies is the separation of powers. Uh, and we don't want to rewrite legislation fully as a court. But the court has in some cases, for instance, where there's an exclusion of a group, for instance, in many of the LGBTQ cases, uh, there was there was a provision, for instance, uh, that related to pensions for a spouse, which was understood at the time only to refer to heterosexual couples. And the court read in all permanent same sex life partner to include a group which had been impermissibly excluded. Um, and so reading in often is very useful to do that where it's not really necessary to burden the legislature uh, to make a major modification to the legislation, but to in sense include a group that was previously excluded. Thank, thank you very, very much. You know, section 177, one of the constitution uh, lays down grounds on which a judge may be removed. Uh, two of those grounds uh, are gross incompetence and gross misconduct, which suggests that mere incompetence and just mere misconduct are not enough to remove a judge, which might sound extraordinary. But the question is, what is the constitutional significance of that choice in the Constitution? Namely, a judge can't be removed just for mere incompetence. It's got to be gross mis incompetence and it can't be removed just because of mere misconduct. It must be gross misconduct. Chief Justice, I think the underlying, again, I think that my approach to the law is very much purposive. What's the purpose underlying the provision? And I think the key goal here is that we cannot have judges removed too easily from their positions. There's, if, if one's going to guarantee judicial independence, one needs to ensure that judges can remain in their positions, can make decisions without the fear of being removed. And I think the worry is that um, if one simply talked about incompetence, someone might say, well, uh, that decision was not competent because they may have disagreed with the outcome or perhaps may have uh, thought that, um, uh, you know, the judge didn't properly evaluate matters. Um, and if you can remove judges too easily, that would allow for interference with the judiciary and judges would be really afraid to make the decisions that they, uh, uh, that, that they should make and the fierce independence that they should demonstrate. And so I think the constitutional drafters uh, put those, those qualifiers, gross and gross misconduct, uh, to distinguish and to also to recognize that on occasion uh, uh, that, um, that, that, that people may behave badly, right? We're human beings, we are flawed, um, but it's a question of whether does the misconduct go to the heart of your function as a judge? Uh, and, and, and we have to ask those kinds of questions, right? It's not just simple a flaw in your, that, that, that you made a mistake uh, and, and you, you didn't behave well, but that does it go to, to, to a fundamental flaw in your capacity to be a judge. And so I would suggest that it's deliberately difficult to remove judges from their office, particularly to guarantee uh, judicial independence. Thank you very much. And what can you tell the uh, commission about the principle of subsidiarity? The principle of subsidiarity, um, I'm, I'm going to give a relatively simplified approach to it, but the constitution requires, for instance, that um, certain legislation is passed to give effect 
to rights, such as the right to access to information and the right to administrative justice in Section 33 of the Constitution. And when you, you're challenging a government uh, decision, for instance, relating to administrative action, you don't come first to the Constitution. You start off, you need to utilize the legislation first and then only you can only challenge, uh, you only engage with the constitution if the legislation is itself not constitutional, uh, uh, is not constitutional. So um, the, um, the principle ultimately protects and respects the, the domain of the legislature. The legislature is required to make the laws and we don't go to constitutional issues unless we have to. If you look at the judgment of the constitutional court in Subramani, as well as uh, the judgment of the Constitutional Court in the treatment action campaign. Uh, what are the features that you find in uh, the treatment action campaign judgment, which you don't find in the uh, Supermani judgment, that you think may have made it easier for the Constitutional Court to reach the judgment, the decision that it reached in uh, uh, the TAC matter? Thanks, Chief Justice. Well, the Subramani matter for all of them, just some of them. Just, just to just to summarise uh, for for those who are also not not familiar with it, dealt with um, access to kidney dialysis for someone, uh, Mr. Subramani, who was terminally ill, um, uh, and and the Constitutional Court was faced, in a sense, with its first socio-economic rights, major socio-economic rights case. Um, with a very difficult judgment because access to kidney dialysis involves, uh, it, it's an expensive treatment, it involves a long time on a machine, and, uh, and so the Constitutional Court was faced square on with the lack of resources in the, uh, in the healthcare system in, in South Africa. And uh, it had to make a judgment about, uh, and it was a deeply, I imagine for the judges at the time, a deeply traumatic judgment because uh, Mr. Subramoni, if he did not receive dialysis, would in fact die. And that is what happened, right? The Constitutional Court said, we, we, we have to construe rights in relation to the resources that are available in the society. And we cannot at the moment, the government has made a good faith decision to, uh, to restrict dialysis to only certain categories of people, for example, who could be cured. Um, we're not prepared to second guess the government in that regard, given it has to ration scarce resources. And as a result, um, we, we, we cannot give Mr. He doesn't fall into those categories and Mr. Subramoni cannot have the treatment uh, that he needs. And he, in fact, passed on a few days after the judgment. That is, in fact, a, a court facing decisions of life and death. And um, before I come to treatment action campaign, let me say, I think the main worry in my view with the court's judgment in Subramoni was its willingness to say that rights are defined by their relationship to resources. I don't think rights should be defined by their relationship to resources. I think people in South Africa do have a right to kidney dialysis. We may not be able to realize it fully at the moment given resource constraints, but the rights place a pressure continually on the government to improve access to those goods such as kidney dialysis. And so the court shouldn't have defined away the right. It should have recognized that there was in fact a justifiable limitation that could have been placed on that right rather than saying that there was no right in the first place. So I worry about that approach to rights in Subramoni. Treatment action campaign ca case dealt with um, the context of the high rates of HIV AIDS in South Africa in the early 2000s and the transmission from mother to child of HIV uh, at, at usually taking place at birth. And it dealt with a, a medication called nevirapine, which was extremely successful in reducing the incidence of transmission of HIV between mother and child at birth. Now, an important facet in this regard was that the manufacturer had made the drug available to the government for free for, I think it was five years. And yet the government at the time said, we're not going to make this, um, we're not going to make this drug, which can help literally save those children's lives available throughout the system 
uh, the healthcare system in South Africa. We're still testing it. We're making it available only at two sites per province. And if one is aware of the size of our country, the fact that many people can't afford transport, it was not possible for people to get to those centers. And so as a result, people would die simply because the government was not making available um, a drug which was available for free. And so in the treatment action campaign case was as a result a lot easier in many ways for the constitutional court. It didn't have to face the resource problem because uh, this was a drug that was available for free to uh, in, in the system. And there wasn't a clear explanation by the government at the time why it was not why it was actually refusing to expand access to this drug across the country and so uh, the constitutional court found that in that case it had been unreasonable um, to refuse to expand access to neveropine across the country and um, that judgment i think there's a study done by harvard saved hundreds of thousands of lives in this country because the government to its credit, followed what the Constitutional Court had said, made the drug available, and it also changed the general approach towards antiretroviral drugs uh, in South Africa, to the extent where I think South Africa now has one of the highest uh, rates of access to antiretroviral drugs in the world, which meant that HIV became a treatable disease and not a death sentence, and as a result, um, it, uh, the, it, it, the, I think that case forever, I use it when I teach overseas as well, to show the power of socioeconomic rights to make an intervention that can literally save hundreds of thousands of lives. My last question, sitting in the constitutional court, deciding, uh, dealing with a constitutional matter, uh, when would you use the remedy of actual severance and when would you use the remedy of uh, notional severance? Chief Justice, I think the uh, remedy of severance is like the opposite remedy of reading in. Uh, reading in is about correcting uh, for the exclusion of a group. If there's, if there's an ability, for instance, without distorting the legislative scheme to, uh, to excise the unconstitutional element of legislation, you would excise that uh, part of the legislation um, and again, you need not send it back to the legislature to address it. Uh, uh, but it mustn't fundamentally alter the constitutional scheme as a whole. Um, it's, it's, in a sense, it's, it's like the, if, you, if you have an, a, a discriminatory provision, you cut out the discriminatory element in that provision. Notional severance is not, it doesn't involve actual cutting out, it involves reading a provision. Uh, uh, as if it's cut out the unconstitutional element. So it's not, it's not the actual um, uh, deletion of words, but it's saying that this is unconstitutional and for in future, um, we are going to read the provision uh, as follows uh, in, in, the, in the following way. Um, and uh, uh, I think this, the case that was done, uh, for instance, was, um, I, I think the name's escaping me right now, but for example, where there was a reverse onus provision, uh, the court and, and an evidentiary burden in relation to property that was, um, uh, uh, which was, which someone was found in possession of stolen property. And my sense is that the court said, well, we're, we're, this can, is not going to be read as a reverse onus, but it must be read as placing an evidentiary burden to explain the possession of the property. So it's not changing the words, it is actually um, reading it in a way that's constitutional going forward. Thank you very much, Minister. Thank you very much, uh, CJ, and uh, good afternoon, Prof. Wilchitz. Good afternoon, uh, Minister. Uh, you, you have uh, already indicated that um, your judgments are cited with uh, your books or writings are cited with approval uh, particularly on socio-economic rights in Peru, Mexico uh, mostly Latin America I guess um, it will be that uh, there are certain characteristics we may have similar to them in terms of an in unequal society how do you think your approach um, 
or on the enforceability of uh, socioeconomic rights could be impacted by this um, co-op co-approach that you're advocating for versus the reasonableness uh, approach thank you very much minister um uh, you are absolutely right, firstly, that there are similarities between South Africa and certain other uh, countries in the global south. And my interest has actually been largely, if you look at my work, has been on global south constitutionalism and actually looking at the comparisons that we can draw between our country um, and some of the leading generally democratic countries around the world, like Colombia and India. Um, and um, I've just released a book that just came out this year, actually the first deep comparison between South Africa and Colombia, which also is a country struggling with poverty, struggling with a legacy of conflict, and also with deep socioeconomic inequalities. Um, what is the difference that the approach that I propose makes? Well, um, uh, Minister, my goal was to try and find a way in which we give a sense in which the socioeconomic rights in our constitution are not just empty promises. They're not just promises that people will get access to these goods in 40 years, in 50 years. They are actual rights. They are claims that people can make. And how do we give effect to the fact that they are claims? How do we give teeth to those rights? And what I tried to do, I said in, in a resource poor situation, which, which is faced by many, many countries, as I say, in the global south, with a large need and limited resources. How are we to deal with the fact that these are rights? And what I suggest is that we need to define as South Africans, and part of this is the role of the court, and part of it is the role of the legislature and the executive. We need to decide, define a minimum level of access to these goods, of housing, of food, of healthcare, of education, right that everyone in this country can have and below which we do not accept is acceptable within the south african political community my reading of the placement of socioeconomic rights in our constitution is that we placed certain things outside the boundaries of politics we said in 1996 that whether you have access to housing food water etc is something that we are going to guarantee as a matter of right but it's easier said than done, right? It's not simple to do in a country which is resource poor with so many demands on the fiscus and so such complicated socioeconomic conditions globally. And so the goal was to define a minimum, right? In my book, I define the minimum relatively at a very low level, but I, one of the suggestions, and I think correctly, is to actually say that we as South Africans can come together and define for us what constitutes the minimum below which we will not accept people go. And the Constitutional Court then enforces that minimum and then requires government over time to improve that minimum to the point where we recognize that everyone has access to fully adequate housing. So there's a distinction between what we might call minimally adequate and sufficiently adequate. And my goal was to say, we cannot tolerate, right? When we go out on the streets in Johannesburg today, on this very rainy and cold day, there are people outside who are not able to have a, a roof over their head, who, who struggle with access to food on a daily basis. We have, in, we have malnutrition only 10 minutes down uh, 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 down the road from where we are now and 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 we need to decide and the district and my reading is the resources in our country and the distribution of resources in our country can guarantee um a minimum level that we will not accept anyone in our community going below to live a life of dignity and autonomy and that is a challenge, I think, not just for the Constitutional Court. It's a challenge both for the legislature, for the executive, but it's also a challenge for the judiciary not to get used to two procedural ideas. In a sense, I've criticized the judiciary for taking the idea of reasonableness. And it's very vague. If I go to someone who lacks food and say to them, you have a right to reasonable government action, that doesn't sound like a right. 
Um, I want to be able to say to someone who is poor, you have a right to sufficient food and the constitutional court will guarantee you at least a minimum level of access to certain resources in our country. I hope that broadly explains it. Yeah, no, I think you have clarified me. The, on the, you, you have mentioned the, back, the workload at the court, and they, I, 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 I suspect it also comes from experience as a clerk and also now. Uh, I just want to get your view. Uh, there has been a suggestion here by Justice uh, Matopo when he was being interviewed that he think that we need to collapse the Supreme Court of Appeal and the Con Court make it one court. Do you think that could uh, improve um, the issues of the in terms of uh, the number of judges, the workload, and also access to to justice? His approach was that maybe we could look at it working in chambers. I think it's an approach of the Supreme Court of Appeal. Minister, uh, my view is uh, that we should not collapse the Supreme Court of Appeal and the Constitutional Court. Uh, I think that uh, both courts perform a very, very important function. And I think it's really critical that one has access to appeals on the basis from high courts, for instance, on the basis of, of, of fact, for instance, in relation to, to criminal law and civil law and that there's a higher body which is uh, made up of a number of judges which considers those issues, as well as the legal principles that are applicable. But I do think it is actually a, a, a really important aspect of our country that we have a, a court which is dedicated to thinking about how to, in a sense, fundamentally transform our law in relation to the imperatives of the South African constitution. And as I've said, I think that applies not just to the constitutional jurisdiction of the constitutional court, but also the general jurisdiction. And the court, whilst, as you've said, the workload is very high, the court still actually has relatively small number of cases compared to uh, the general appellate jurisdiction required of the Supreme Court of Appeal. I, I don't have the exact stats with me, but I, you, you will be more familiar with that. Um, but the, the court that does provide an opportunity, despite the intense pressure of the workload of giving deeper consideration to the most fundamental principles in our uh, political community and how to give effect to rights. And so I think, and, and, I, and, I, and so I do think that actually there's room for both sets of courts. I think we can improve, as you've said, in terms of the workload. There have been certain um, proposals made by the Chief Justice as to as to how to address particularly the big burden that arises from applications on leave to appeal, where we need eight judges to signify their agreement as to whether to accept or, dis or dismiss a case in relation to leave to appeal. And it seems to me that there are ways institutionally to address that through, for example, allowing smaller panels to make those decisions and also enhancing perhaps the the, the, the experience or having some experienced lawyers who assist in the preparation of those uh, of memorandums, although the final decision must always be made by constitutional court judges. Thank you very much, SG. Thank you, Minister. Uh, Justice Muller Miller. Thank you very much, Chief Justice. Maybe to take up on the last point, um, where you suggestion in relation first of all i didn't even greet you good afternoon good afternoon justice how, how are you yeah, president sorry uh <laughs> really nice to engage with you yes thank you very much um so it's just a follow-up to the minister's question uh, in relation to easing the workload of the constitutional court um because i mean it's something in the public domain that uh, the, its workload, and of course that applies to other courts as well, has increased tremendously. And it would seem that that is having an impact in the delivery or expeditious handing down of judgments. And uh, my question is, um, I'm not now talking about collapsing the Constitutional Court and the, and, uh, the Supreme Court of Appeal. But just on that point that you made, that perhaps um, other people could be involved to assist in relation to the preparation of uh, memoranda and so forth, um, would increasing the number of judges in that court not assist 
uh, in relation to that aspect. President uh, Molemela, thank you for that. Maybe let, let me interrupt myself just to say, I know that it would require a constitutional amendment. So many solutions actually will require a constitutional, constitutional amendment. amendment. Yes. yes. But um, would that alleviate the problem? I think we need to debate a lot of different possible institutional solutions to some of the issues that we're facing as a judiciary in South Africa. I think we also have to remember that, um, uh, you know, a lot of people also still face problems in accessing the courts. And so if we were to make access to the courts easier, we would face even more cases. And, and I, I support making, making access to the courts easier. And so we need to, we, we need to grapple very strongly with, 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 with what are the possible institutional solutions to, do, to deal with this. Um, one, as you've suggested, I mean, I think one possibility would be to increase the number of judges. I, I think we would need to rethink the rule of on bank uh, decisions then. Uh, I don't see how it's already already with 11 judges. As we've said, one of the difficulties and reasons for delay is to bring everyone on board and to ensure everyone's opinions are taken concern of. Um, and so I think one would need to, if we, if we did increase the number of judges, and of course there are constitutional courts, like for example in Germany, um, they sit in two panels, 8-8, uh, uh, and, um, and, and we, we could, for instance, have a, 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 a way of approaching matters where I think the strongest case for a large number of judges sitting together is where uh, a, an act of parliament is declared unconstitutional, because that is the strongest exercise of judicial power that we have. I, I wonder in terms of, for example, whether the general jurisdiction of the court could also be dealt with through sitting in panels. That may be an option even without increasing the number of judges. But I think that, I think ultimately in South Africa, if we are going to make access to justice um, accessible to everyone, we are gonna have an increasing demand on the courts. Um, the last report I saw from the judiciary, I think which was 2022, said that there were 253, I think, high court ju uh, justices across the country. Um, that is a very small number for a, for a large country. And uh, although I don't want to give the Minister of Justice heart failure, uh, <laughs> I think that uh, uh, we, we do need to grapple with the need for more judges across our country. Uh, just to give you a sense from my comparative experience, in Colombia, they have an action called the Tutela Action, which allows people whose rights are violated to approach a court and to receive a decision in it, it, it dispenses with a lot of formalities and to receive a decision within about uh, 10 days. Uh, they have thousands of judges across the country and the workload of the Constitutional Court, when I went there, uh, I just saw uh, there's almost like a warehouse of files. That itself raises lots of problems and I'm not sure we should go that model. I think South Africa, we've adopted a different approach by trying to allow the public protector and South African Human Rights Commission to address many many of the, the ordinary complaints people have. But I think your proposal is one that I think we need to think about very seriously as we recognize that we plan for the future. The demand in the judiciary is not gonna get lower. It's probably gonna get higher. Of course, we can hope that, uh, you know, in many ways, um, uh, our human rights will be more realized in South Africa, but there are many challenges facing us. And as I say, I think that would be one proposal we need to think about. Thank you very much. My second and last question, um, and maybe I, I should give a preamble to say um, I embrace the diversity that comes with Section 174.5 that you have referred to. So please, uh, I just want to put your mind at rest that the question that I'm going to ask you is not because I think that an academic should not be appointed in that court. I think it is important for purposes of diversity. Um, however, it is a fact that um, there are um, ways in which the competence of judges can be assessed very, very easily. Um, there are a number of uh, factors that can be taken into account, but um, the um, ability to work under pressure, for example, is one of one of the good indicators of a good judge. And um, the 
ability to also produce work of good quality under pressure. So in relation to a judge, one would uh, look at their judgments and say, uh, this judge has a, a track record of writing very good judgments, well reasoned, uh, the analysis is perfect, and importantly, they are produced reasonably quickly. In your case, um, you, you have not yet authored a judgment and I'm not criticizing you for that. I don't expect an academic to produce a judgment. I mean, where would they have written it? Um, the point that I'm just making is, while for me, it was easy to assess the quality of your articles, I've read them and I found them to be of good quality. Um, there's one area in which I want you to assist me in relation to your ability to work under pressure and to produce um, results relatively quickly. Because, you know, the situation for judges is like we are standing at the end of a conveyor belt. We are working all the time, but at the same time, we have to wait at the end of the conveyor belt to receive new work. So it's an ongoing uh, pressurized environment. And I want you to persuade me that you can work under those circumstances. Um, so I would like you to make examples because ordinarily I'm not able to assess. And in fact, the GCB as well in their report quite correctly uh, state that it is not easy to apply the ordinary criteria in relation to you. And um, so I know that we, we would assess your, the quality of your judgment by looking at how impactful it has been. And I have no doubt that your articles have been impactful. There you are. You say uh, they have been relied upon in Peru and in Mexico and in several other countries. I have no issue with them. But um, can you give examples of how you were able to work under pressure meet deadlines and still be able to produce work of good quality. I know that as an academic, to become a full professor, which you are, you have to author articles and you have mentioned, you have alluded to that. You, you also have to supervise students and so forth and so forth. But I want you to please give me examples of um, how we can fairly say, uh, Professor Bilshitz will be able to work um, hard and produce very quick results in terms of judgments at the Constitutional Court. Thank you. President Molamela, I don't want to suggest that the academic experience is able to be entirely comparable in any way with, with the pressures of judging. At the same time, um, the academic experience also isn't like, I, I wish it were a case that we, we just spent all our days thinking and writing we, we, we have various pressures in terms of we, we teach courses, as you've said, we, we, have, we have administrative responsibilities, uh, we have, uh, you know, we, I, I've been very involved in actually trying to stimulate academic engagements. I ran a massive conference, for instance, uh, for, uh, with over 650 registered delegates from all around the world in South Africa, um, and I, I, I balance those elements with being productive. So I think what what I can say to your response is that um, the the I, I think my productivity as an academic in some ways, uh, my ability to produce multiple articles, it, it's not a sense in which I had a, for instance, around the book, I had a sabbatical and that's not comparable. But when you have ordinary academic work and you are busy organizing massive conferences and you still bring out a book, you still bring out a second book now uh, that's just come out with an edited collection uh, and writing. I think it suggests that I'm able to manage and juggle the demands of a, a, a range of demands that are in the profession of, of particular pressures uh, with the, the, the need to be productive and to be able to achieve um, uh, a, 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 a decent level of productivity of also what, as you've said, is quality work. So I think the key thing is that one, one, one needs to work under pressure to produce quality work. I think one of the benefits of academia is that we do at times have the op 
opportunity to step back. And I think what, what I think an academic candidate may bring is the ability from that stepping back to draw on that, that, that experience to be able to more quickly be able to address some of the issues in the judgments. Uh, and so um, seeing that, you know, one doesn't have to go and get all that depth uh, as you busy learning about the matter, but you've already got the depth of experience, you, you can bring it relatively quickly into the judgments that you write. Um, as you've said, I have had pressures around producing reports. So there are aspects where we produced a massive report uh, around uh, the performance of the South African Constitution for International Idea, and we had set deadlines around that. Uh, and and, and th there are other examples like that uh, of having produced reports, of having to uh, work with civil society. For instance, I, I was asked to uh, appear before the United Nations to make input around a business and human rights treaty. Uh, I, together with my institute and other civil society organizations, uh, organized a meeting of civil society. Um, and we had to, in, within a couple of weeks, produce documents and inputs into that process. So. These are some examples I can give you of what I've done, but I can't give you an exact parallel of the pressures that, that you may face as a judge. Uh, but I hope it may satisfy you that I'm, I'm capable of, of working under that pressure. Yes, uh, sorry, Chief Justice, just a, a last comment, once again, to, to put your mind at rest. Just to say that uh, we have had academics uh, who became judges at the Supreme Court of Appeal and the Constitutional Court and who fared very, very well. They, uh, they were very good judges. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Justice Muller Miller. Uh, I've been informed that the latest we can uh, take our lunch is two in terms of the hotel. Uh, otherwise, after that, I think I'm told there may be safety safety issues about food. So, <laughs> so that being the case, I'm thinking that the next uh, one, uh, I'll let them be the last one before we take the lunch break, the next commissioner to ask questions, and then we can, we can continue after that. Uh, the next one will be Commissioner Moimang. Uh, thank you, uh, Chief Justice. Uh, greetings to you, uh, Prof. Greetings, Commissioner. Uh, just a, a follow-up on the on, on the the minimum versus reasonableness approach. Uh, <clears throat> don't you think that the that the approach uh, by the court? Uh, uh, on uh, or on uh, Masibuku, on Khrod bomb, and on treatment action campaign, uh, was mainly informed by the fact that uh, uh, the court appreciated the the uh, the separation of powers uh, and the fact that uh, the executive is much more in a better place. To, to, to provide information in terms of uh, even the, the, the resource constraints is, is better place to determine the budget allocation uh, as, uh, as, as opposed to, as opposed to uh, uh, relegating, relegating that uh, to, 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 to uh, an arm of government that necessarily uh, uh, is not in that position because budget budget allocation uh, uh, balancing the priority needs. The best arm of government to do that is the executive, and therefore, hence the court was a bit cautious in terms of uh, descending into the arena uh, of uh, terrain that belongs to the executive arm of government. Thank you. Thank you very much, Commissioner. You raised one of the main uh, questions, and that was raised about the justiciability of social rights. For many years, academics said, well, social rights can't really be justiciable because we don't want uh, the judiciary to be making decisions about issues which have huge budgetary implications. Um, and there are three main um, 
challenges, right? The one is a legitimacy challenge. What is the court the right space in which to make these choices? Uh, the competency, does the court have a competency? And that these rights were actually to some extent indeterminate, that they, um, they, they, they don't have a clear content. And um, over the years, there's been a number of different ways of responding to that. Um, the first uh, important response, I think, to you is that is the approach, is what the court does in relation to socioeconomic rights fundamentally different to what it does in relation to civil and political rights? Civil and political rights, the court gives expression to, um, it, it gives content to a right. So let's take the right to vote, which is all on our minds at the moment, right? And the court identifies a standard, right? And says, we need to ensure the secrecy of the ballot, right? The court role is to interpret the right. Now, the legislature and executive need to go and, and give effect to what does it mean to give effect to the secrecy of the ballot? Uh, and what is required for that? Maybe a special computerized system, ink on our thumbs, all kinds of different ways of doing that, right? But the role of the court there is to define the constitutional standard against which we test whether the executive or legislative action meets that constitutional standard, right? And some forms of, of, of approaching to voting will meet that standard and some forms won't. My argument has been that socioeconomic rights doesn't impose a, a task on the court fundamentally different to the task that it has in relation to civil and political rights. The South African people, when passing the constitution in 1996, included social rights. And they, and they said specifically that judges would be able to decide ultimately whether action of the government or the legislature meets the constitutional standard. And so my argument is it is entirely appropriate for judges within the constitutional court to outline the standards that these rights require of the government. Not to tell them exactly what to do, but to tell them does, what is that minimum standard that's required? Does it involve, for instance, protection from the elements, the rain that we now have? And does the approach of the housing ministry, does it actually meet that standard? Well, then the court can evaluate that. But if the court simply says to the government, be reasonable, right? You, whatever you do must be reasonable. That is a very vague standard. It doesn't really tell us what people can claim and it fails to give proper expression to the interpretation of rights. So uh, I hope I've, in, 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 in a brief way, I haven't dealt with all those objections I mentioned. We can, we can have a discussion about that if you want to. But I think part of it is I, I'm, I'm trying to stick with the role of the court in interpreting rights. And I believe that there's an opportunity, what we see in academic life, for a kind of dialogue between the courts and other branches of government in how best to give effect to these rights, which are so really vital in our political community. Thank you. The, 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 second, the second one relates to, I, I see that uh, uh, you also express yourself on the positive corporate fundamental rights, uh, the uh, legal obligation of business. Uh, now, the, now the question that I want to pose uh, in relation to to the latest amendment to the company's uh, amendment bill and the second amendment bill, uh, which is a, a direct uh, result of the, the work of the, Zondo com of the Zondo Commission and the recommendation that uh, the company's amendment bill must be amended to remove the time bar in terms of uh, uh, holding the directors of companies uh, accountable, uh, even when they have left the company where uh, malfeasance could have happened. Uh, uh, but the, the, the second aspect related to that also, to the main, to the main uh, uh, bill, is, 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 is the extent to which shareholders uh, uh, will uh, hold the board of directors accountable in terms of the remuneration policy. Uh, uh, but also more than that, uh, the fact that uh, uh, the shareholders will be able to determine uh, what has to be attached to the 
to the uh, C C CPIC in terms of the annual financial statement. They would want to report in terms of uh, the extent to which uh, the shareholders are, are able to hold the board of directors accountable in terms of dealing with the inequality and disparities between the directors, the shareholders, and ordinary employees of company to deal with the, the, the gap in terms of uh, uh, inequality. What is your view in relation to that against uh, uh, your uh, position in relation to uh, the legal obligations on, of, of, of a business and also positive uh, obligations that you are imposing in terms of ethics to the uh, companies? Thank you. Commissioner, I, I think there may be a degree to which I can't answer questions as a sitting judge or as someone who, um, who, who, who may be appointed to the Constitutional Court about specific legislative provisions um, because uh, that could implicate, because they could come before the court itself. Um, what I can say, I can perhaps answer your question in broad terms about corporate responsibility and the need to think about um, uh, what I've tried to suggest is that we should not see a corporation as purely a body that is designed to maximize the profit of shareholders. That a corporation is a body that is actually created by statute. And for that reason, it is meant to bring social benefits to our society. And there are certain traditional approaches to why it can bring social benefits because it provides separate legal personality, etc. Um, but those various elements of a corporation, separate legal personality, particularly in limited liability, create various threats uh, and, and, and challenges uh, for, on the one hand, uh, the relationship between uh, shareholders and directors and um, uh, the, uh, the, the, the responsibility of the company uh, more generally, financially, right? And, and a lot of company law is trying to address um, the, the potential irresponsibility that's created by, uh, uh, by this principle of separate legal personality and trying to address the separation of ownership and control and these kinds of questions. Um, and the key approach of the company being also to advance social goods as well. Our company act does say that, in fact. And I think there's a pretty clear reading of our constitution, which is why I'm not straying too much into controversial territory here where, where companies are in fact bound by, uh, by the Bill of Rights um, and bound by obligations in terms of the Bill of Rights. So to the extent that, as I said, I, I'm not sure I can express myself on the particular amendments and the particular purposes that they, that, that they, are, given, that they are being given, but um, I, what I think we need to recognize is that there has been a shift in South Africa. Um, with the passing of our constitution, from a simple um, recognition that a corporation is just part of the private sphere and must go about its role, no matter the effects on others in the community, to a recognition that it has wider social responsibilities, uh, wider responsibilities for rights, and has to act in a way that is accountable, um, both to those who are parts of the company, as well as those who are outside of the company as well. Thank you, Prof. Thank you, Chief Justice. Thank you very much. Uh, we are at uh, seven minutes to two. I think we should take the lunch break now. Um, uh, Professor Pilchitz will take the lunch break now. Uh, should we take 30 or 40 minutes? 40 minutes? Okay. Uh, we will then for take uh, 40 minutes. Uh, that will take us to 25 to 3. So let's return at 25 to 3. Uh, you will come back at that time as well, uh, Professor Pilchitz. Thank you, Chief Justice. Thank you very much. Uh, Professor Pilchitz. We are going to continue with the interview, but I'm going to uh, ask you to try your best, please, to be succinct in your responses. I did give you some leeway in the morning, uh, so uh, try and uh, not be 
uh, long. Thanks, Chief Justice. I will track. Thank you. The next commissioner is uh, Commissioner Steinbeck. Uh, good afternoon. Good afternoon, Commissioner Steinbeck. I want to follow up actually on the last question that was raised and uh, really the question of uh, the separation of powers. Um, I, I don't accept that um, uh, setting a standard for one of the ordinary political or civil rights is quite the same uh, as setting a standard for a socioeconomic right. Um, both because there are necessarily bigger budgetary implications, but also even more importantly, because there are fundamental policy choices for any government to make. Um, if, if a government decides that the right to housing is best achieved through um, you know, facilitating loans or subsidies, or uh, then th that is that is government policy within the realm of what democracies do. Um, and coming out of that, I, I, I want to ask you specifically: when you say you could set a standard, say for housing or health. Um, are you, are, is a court going to tell a government that there must be four walls, a roof, this or that? Is a court going to say access to primary health care, and that includes the following, um, in the clinic? The, there must be X number of clinics per, you know, no, no one should have to go further than X number of kilometers. How, how, what does it mean to set a standard in an area that is highly specialized, highly policy driven, and budgetary, enormous budgetary implications? So that's, that's question one really, is practically, what does it look like? If you could write what the minimum content for housing and health are, what would they be? And then following that, um, if, if government says we don't have budget um, or we don't agree that that should be the minimum standard, um, aren't you setting up the courts for a legitimacy crisis? That, that you impose a standard that government is unwilling and unable to meet. Um, you know, you, you made a, a fairly offhand comment that we have sufficient resources for these things. How do you know that? How do you know we have sufficient resources for a particular level of service? Um, how, how does a court ever know that? Um, and what then happens when government comes to the court and says, well, that's your minimum standard, but we can't meet it? Thank you very much, Commissioner Steinberg. And I know also I'm aware that we have disagreed in academics uh, 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 journals about these questions. So it's nice to engage with you about these, these in, in this forum. Let me first say that I don't accept that socioeconomic questions in South Africa are simply a matter of policy. Um, in my view, they are in the Constitution because they are rights. And rights mean something and require something um, and, that, and they require something of the judiciary, not alone of the um, executive and the legislature. And so uh, the question is perhaps, uh, and you wanted to ask me, what would it look like to, to provide a standard? Uh, so l let us take the, the, the approach of the uh, Constitutional Court in the Mazibuko case, um, where the, the standard uh, where a community, not far from here, uh, 
challenged the minimum basic water allowance as not being Sorry, sufficient. I'm going to interrupt you because I think water's too easy. I'd like you to talk about health care and housing, one of those two. Okay, well, uh, yeah. I mean, I think often, and the way we work academically is also to, to, to be able to understand from the simple principle to the, to the more complex, and so that's why I'm starting with water. Um, and, I, and I just want to, I, I want to explain what I mean in relation to that, is that um, the, the Constitutional Court simply said, well, we have to assess the reasonableness of government's policy in relation to water. But my question is, how do you assess reasonableness without actually considering the needs people have in relation to water? And so what the High Court and the SCA did, which I think in fact were better decisions, is they said, well, in order to work out whether the government has been reasonable, we need to work out whether people have enough water to drink. Do they have enough water to clean? Do they have enough water to wash? Do they have enough water for various purposes that underlie the human interest in water? And then once we understand that, that's the general standard that the court sets, which must be met. And it may be different in different parts of the country in terms of what's required and et cetera. And that will be up to the government to decide. But the general standard is in relation to water, sufficient water will be sufficient water that meets the human needs for water in relation to, and one can specify that a little bit more detail. In relation, you asked me about housing. So how would one specify a minimum in relation to housing? Well, I think one of the elements of housing that people need, as I mentioned, is the fundamental aspect is protection from the elements, right? So that they're not outside in a torrential rainstorm or as is happening in the Cape at the moment, a, a hurricane. Um, and then we, we need to also have a look. We actually have some suggestions from the Constitutional Court in the Khrutpuram uh, case, right? And, it, and what disappointed me in Khrutpuram is to some extent the court set a minimum standard, but it refused to say it was setting a minimum standard. And it actually said, well, what constitutes de desperate need? What constitutes that minimum that people need when they're in crisis situations? And those minimums included protection from the elements with access to uh, basic services in sanitary conditions. Um, there we have an ability to set a standard and then we can ask ourselves, does any government program meet the standard that the rights require in that area? Um, now, we could have a kind of long debate about that. I think one of the ways we could also have a participative process in some ways in doing that. So one, one, one thing that's happened in relation to education is that actually um, a number of NGOs have gone to court and asked for minimum standards for schools. And um, what's happened is the court hasn't set the minimum standard, but it's required the government to set that minimum standard. I would also be comfortable with that approach because it allows for input from other branches of government into what constitutes that minimum standard, but it also sets a minimum standard so that we know when people around our country come and ask us, do we have the right to basic education? We know what constitutes at least the minimum conditions for that basic education. So I hope I've touched on that a little bit. Um, and you asked me then the question, well, what about the budget? What happens if we absolutely don't have the resources or how do we know that we have the resources or that we don't have the resources well in many cases it isn't that difficult to tell and in some cases the court the constitutional court has simply said for instance that um, uh, in relation to the extension for example of grants uh, to permanent residents uh, the court looked at some of the evidence that was put before it and clearly recognized that um, there was enough uh, resources in that regard. Um, the court can always ask for input. Again, I don't see this as a, I see it as a sort of dialogical process of engagement in that regard. Um, and I do also, my approach is not an inflexible approach. I never say, uh, uh, certainly in my the book, I argue that the minimum core places a special duty upon the government to justify when it fails to meet the minimum standard. Um, and that seems to me very similar to the jurisprudence that has been adopted, for instance, in relation to the right to privacy. In the right to privacy, where there is a failure, there's, a, there's an intrusion into the very heartland of privacy that is the home, the court places a very strong duty on the government to justify it, uh, any intrusion, and it still says we have privacy in other dimensions, but the duty becomes a lesser duty. And it seems to me that there's a similar point in relation to 
um, socioeconomic rights. One of the things that I'm concerned about, and this happens in all contexts where there are rights, is that it's very convenient and easy to say, well, there are no resources. And, and what seems to me to be required by having social rights in the Constitution is to place a special duty on government to justify and say, can we not afford to provide people in this country with enough protection from the elements? Can we not afford in this country to ensure that there's no malnutrition? Can we ensure to, to ensure that people don't have access to clean drinking water? And if you are going to say that, you have to show that you have a, an absolute scarcity that, and, and generally some kind of crisis that might come, for instance, through climate change, where there is a la lack of la absolute resources, for instance, in relation to water. But uh, again, you need to try and plan for addressing those kinds of issues. And part of socioeconomic rights is to require that justification and a particularly stringent justification where minimum standards are not met. I hope I've, to some extent, I mean, we may not fully agree still, but I've hoped to some extent uh, express yeah. my perspective thank on you. this. Thank you. I just want to thank follow you. up. And thank you, Co I want us Commissioner Matolo, let me follow up. Yes, I, you know, I understand you are speaking about this core minimum standard approach. You know, in a, an unequal country like we have, obviously, if we have to put standards, we have to take something from the other to augment to the other. So, how do you think? How do you think this can be done? I'm talking about issues about land. Already, if we have to take land from those who have it, and reallocate it to those who need the land. Obviously, that's going to be a challenge. So how do you see it? Because I, I, may be, I, I don't like an abstract doctrine. I need, I need you to give me you know, tangible things. Thanks. Thank you, Commissioner. Um, I think you're absolutely right that what the Constitution did when it entrenched social rights is it said to us that the level of inequality in South African society is not acceptable. And that actually we have to ensure in this country that there will be a redistribution to initially make sure that every single person has that minimum level. And over time, we're able to address the full needs of individuals. I recognize, of course, one can't immediately ensure fully adequate housing, and there has a lot that's been done in this area. But ultimately, what we've said in our society is we're not putting rights simply on the paper, right? We are trying to give effect to those rights. And my goal in outlining the minimum core approach is to try and say, how do we make these rights meaningful for the people of South Africa? And yes, you're absolutely right. It requires the expenditure of resources. It may mean taking from less priority areas to more priority areas, but it places at the heartland of the political community, the realization of the most basic rights of individuals in South Africa. And that's why I wrote that actually uh, socioeconomic rights are in some senses political rights as well because they require our community to attend to the needs of those who are the least well off in our community. Okay, Chief Justice, I'll leave there. Thank you, Commissioner Marumwahai. Thank you very much, uh, Chief Justice. Good afternoon, Professor Good afternoon, Richards. I have two questions for you. Um, the first question that I have, is with regards to section 167, subsection three of the constitution, uh, which deals with the jurisdiction or the two ways in which one can approach the, the constitutional court. And I'm more interested on the second leg, which you have been referring to as a general jurisdiction. When one looks at um, the, the C part of that, it says the final decision has to be made uh, on the issue of jurisdiction, it must be made by the court. The question that I have is, this jurisdictional point says there must be an arguable point of law of general importance. Given the fact that the decision is made by the constitutional court and not the person who's actually applying. Because once you apply for leave to appeal or whatever, you are going to the constitutional court, 
you may believe that your case raises these things. What are the parameters that the judges who are deciding on this issue should actually look into to determine that if the matter is not a constitutional matter, does fall into this particular jurisdictional point? Commissioner, uh, the Constitutional Court has uh, uh, begun the process already of trying to develop the outlines of its general jurisdiction. And particularly, I refer to the Paulson case. And it outlines the different elements of there needs to be an arguable point of law, right? So there needs to be, first, it must be a point of law and not a point of fact. It needs to be arguable. And what are indicia of arguability? For instance, the court says if there was a disagreement between a majority or minority in the SCA, or disagreement between two courts, or a narrow ruling in some ways, right? Um, so arguability um, is something we have various indicia to tell us where it's an arguable point of law of general public importance. So again, it can't just be a matter, the court has said this already, um, that relates to the individuals before the court itself. It needs to have general importance. It needs to be something that has, affects the South African community as a whole or legal, legal principle as a whole. It's not just about solving the case before you. That is matters for the other courts. And so that doesn't engage the jurisdiction of the court. And then the last part of that is which ought to be considered by the court. And the court has said that that includes the whole panoply of factors that come into a determination of the interests of justice. So uh, there are a range of issues where even if we have a matter that's arguable point of law uh, of general public importance, that the court will not hear the case on the basis of the interests of justice. And so those are the three elements that the court has developed in relation to the general jurisdiction. Um, and I think no doubt this is relatively new. Obviously, it was instituted only about 10 years ago, and we will see the developments of those principles over time even further. No, no, thank you very much for that. My second question is in relation, you know, I, I've experienced in academia <coughs> that sometimes as academics, we, we, we do research that speaks about the vulnerability of other people. And we, we do research because we want to influence policy or law that really assist in making sure that those people's uh, unfortunate circumstances are, are addressed. But what I've realized is, as academics, we don't look at what we are doing within our own space and within the injustices that are happening within our own space. And I'm asking you this in relation to the transformation issues generally in, in academia. And I'm asking you in relation to the letter of Nadal, um, I'm not talking about all the other things. There's a line in that letter where they say, the candidate's commitment to human rights and constitutional values needs to be probed, right? And I'm asking on that spirit. In academia, currently, I see that your, your, your first article um, was in two, nine, 1998, uh, as it seems here. And from what I see here, you have co which is commendable, you have co-published with about nine or 10 people. That's, those are the number of people that I, that I came when I was looking at, your, at, your, at your, your work. Currently in academia, we have a challenge where we don't have black female South African professors. What has been your role in ensuring that you, one, mentor, assist, and develop, um, particularly, and by black, I'm not talking statutorily black, I'm talking about black people of African descent, because we are struggling to have those kind of female professors in, in, and I'm talking about full professors, in what has been your contribution? Because from your publication, it doesn't seem like you, you unless of course I'm, I'm wrong and you, 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 you stand to, to, to correct me, of course, yes. Uh, thank you, Commissioner. I agree with you wholeheartedly that we need to do better in the academic community in relation to transformation on racial and gender lines. And um, I would suggest to you that my contribution has been in, in, in several respects uh, in, in doing that. The institute that I direct, um, part of its whole goal is to nurture a new generation of public law academics with a particular focus on black and female academics. And I have tried in my nurturing and mentoring, right? And that involves, as you will know, um, 
there is a long process involved. Uh, as the Chief Justice said, it took me 10 years of study plus uh, another eight years or so, and that's relatively quick to move up into the higher echelons of academia. Um, I was mentored and provided with the mentorship to move and to, to understand how to become an academic uh, and, and how to develop my skills. I've tried to do that as well for other academics, younger junior academics in the sphere, and particularly black and female academics as well. And we currently have at my institute an all black team, uh, uh, we, uh, mostly female over the last period. Um, and I have sought to nurture um, younger academics through that process of commenting on their work and a deep engagement. It's not just about saying, you must publish, because I don't think that's fair. I think it's about addressing the, the, the question of how, how do you write well academically? How do you reach those senior echelons? And I think that's really, really critical that we do that. I've also sat on the Constitutional Court Trust, and every year I volunteer myself to try and send, to get, give people opportunities that I had to go and study overseas. And the Constitutional Court Trust has two scholarships, the Franklin Thomas and the Pius Lunger Scholarship. One of those is particularly designated for people from previously disadvantaged groups. And I've tried to sit each year and, and, and um, assess the candidates because I want to see that we get the best candidates going across to study, to learn. We have very good universities here. People can study and learn here, but also to study and learn overseas, to get that wider, broader experience, that they can come back to South Africa and bring that wider, broader experience as well. Um, I've also co-written with academics and junior academics from other, uh, from previously disadvantaged groups. For example, my most recent book, co-edited, with a fantastic young academic, uh, and, uh, and, and it was co-edited with her, um, and is now, and, and it gauges with the comparison, as I mentioned, between Colombia and South Africa. So I hope that satisfies you that I am committed to um, process of a transformation. I think you are right, there are certain structural aspects which we still haven't got right. For example, um, I don't think there's enough postgraduate funding uh, for uh, individuals in South Africa to do postgraduate degrees and particularly PhDs. Uh, I know the NRF, the National Research Foundation, has attempted to improve the situation, but it is still very difficult if you come from a poorer background in South Africa to be able to afford to be able to study in South Africa for a PhD. And it seems to me that those are the kinds of structural interventions that we need in order to advance and improve at the senior level uh, the number of black and female academics in our country. Sorry, uh, uh, Chief Justice, if I can just wrap up this, the, the, yeah, this, this okay. point. Okay. Uh, because I think it, it, it's really important. Okay, uh, I, I just remind you, Professor Dilchis, to try and be succinct. Sorry, Chief Justice, okay. I'm trying to give full answers. Okay. Uh, Prof. Bilchitz, when you were speaking earlier on, there's one important quote that you made. You said, who must do what for whom? And I'm asking you this question based on that. We have a challenge, and, 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 and I specifically said to you, um, black South Africans, and I'm talking about people of African descent, we don't have, I mean, in, in the country, the whole country, you, you'll be lucky if you can count about five full black professors, right? And I'm saying you have been publishing from 1998 up until today. How difficult is it to have a black South African mentor that black South African? I've written with quite a few, it's not a, the most difficult thing. How, how difficult is it uh, for white professors in this country? And I, I, I'm, not, I'm not pinning this on you. You know, it's, not, it's just a conversation that I'm having with you, which I've had with my colleagues. How difficult is it for these white professors who, 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 who have been doing this for, for years and they have the skills to just pass on those skills, to co-publish with somebody, to show the person the, the, the journey of publishing, because we know how important it is. In our, and I will leave it there. It's not an attack on you, please. But just to say even better, how much better not to just co-publish, but to enable someone to publish on their own and to become their own academic in their own right. And I've tried to do that uh, in my work 
I've had numerous success. I will tell you, I can't give you the exact uh, statistics on, but we had in this last six year period, 65 units of publication produced by my, uh, the institute that I direct, 737 journal articles and 14 book chapters. Many of those published by black and female and black female uh, academics. And that is what I'm seeking to do, is to do exactly what you said, to try and share, impart, and enable uh, others to do and to be able to achieve the highest echelons of the academic enterprise. Thank you, Chief Justice. Thank you. Uh, Minister, follow up. Uh, uh, what I don't get from the prof, uh, I may be a layman in that space of publishing. It doesn't come out clearly whether you have co-published with these female um, Africans that the prof is asking about. Have you co-published with them or do you have such articles? Yes, I have co-published with a number of junior academics, including with, as I've said, I've co-edited and published with uh, just recently a black female academic with a book and uh, as well as uh, a, an article before. And so that it has indeed that has indeed happened. Thank you. Commissioner Makwanisha. No, thank you very much, uh, CJ. Uh, good afternoon, Professor. In. I think as a follow up to Professor Maruma Hai, um, I do think that it should be a very short answer. How many black female doctoral graduates have you produced? And how many black female postdoctoral graduates or fellows have you produced? It should be a very short answer. Let me have a look at the statistics. Uh, in terms of PhDs, I've only supervised one PhD, and that was a white female uh, PhD. Uh, there hasn't been a large um, uh, PhD uh, output. Um, from 2016 to date, um, uh, Five of the seven postdocs have been black, um, six of the 12 researchers are black, and eight of the 12 female. Thank you. In a response to the Chief Justice, you said that you have never been in any adjudicative role until recently. And yet you trained judges in Kenya and Tunisia. What were you training them on? I was training on, I was involved in the constitution making process in Tunisia. And in that process, I played an important role in the placement of a limitations clause in the a Tunisian constitution, which engages with when rights can be limited. And um, the, the, the giving effect to that limitation clause has been difficult in the political community in hang on hang on i must uh, just intervene the question is what were you training the judges in <laughs> kenya on oh in kenya not tunisia no. I, th I thought sorry I oh, heard... oh both both, both. both. I'm okay sorry. i heard i heard tunisia first yeah, okay so and so in tunisia the the training was on how to give effect to a limitations clause and on the principle particularly of proportionality and how to understand the principle of proportionality, what South African courts have done with the principle of proportionality, as well as I have some more global experience on the principle of proportionality. In relation to Kenya, there was a transition in uh, 2000, and uh, there was a new constitution, and a whole process whereby there was a, a, a vetting of judges, and new judges came in around 2010, and as part of my work in the International Association of Constitutional Law, um, I, uh, I, I, was, I, I, went, I went across as part of a project that I was involved in developing, um, and we trained the judges also on the limitation of rights and also on socioeconomic rights, and because these were relatively new in the Kenyan constitution. So uh, with, with a global experience around socioeconomic rights and around limitation of rights, and I found there was a very strong willingness amongst judges to engage with academics and to understand what the experience was worldwide in that regard. Thank you, Chief Justice. Thank you. Can I just ask a follow-up question? Uh, you see, to me, when you say train, it's like you were teaching them how to 
do the job, which in my mind is different from giving a lecture, like in a lecture hall, to say this is how uh, you apply a limitation clause and so on. So which of the two was it? Chief Justice, it was more smaller workshops, which was only with judges. We, 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 did, we wanted judges to be able to speak freely and to engage. So it wasn't about a lecture. It was about providing input. So it was to the extent that I, I obviously couldn't talk to judges about writing a judgment on socioeconomic rights, but I could explain to judges what the different approaches were towards socioeconomic rights around the world, uh, how, what, how issues around like that have been raised here around the separation of powers have been addressed, uh, putting de various options and perspectives, uh, what, for example, on evictions law, South Africa has been very progressive in that regard, and, and the judges then were able to interact and ask questions about the, the jurisprudence that has existed around the world and how, for instance, we would, we would, we would suggest uh, it, it could be applicable in the Kenyan context or the Tunisian context. So I hope that gives you a sense of what, 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 what took place in those workshops. And as I mentioned, I've also designed a course for the Mexican judiciary as well around the content of rights and giving expression to the way rights are around the world. So it was, it was workshops. I, I would put it more yeah, as workshops. More like yes. this, like, okay, so that's all right. Thank you, Commissioner Matolo Zepu. Just as I, um, Chief Justice, I've done my part. Oh, you're done, okay, thank you. I thought it was a follow-up. Commissioner Nyami. Thank you, CJ. Afternoon, Professor. Afternoon. Uh, the first question is uh, in relation to the speed at which the constitutional court uh, delivers judgment has raised some concern among South Africans, the delay in terms of judgments. We are fortunate to have an academic having started there as a clerk and now acting at the constitutional court. What can be done to address this concern in your view? Thank you very much. The first thing I just point out to you as, you, as you've mentioned, is that like as a law clerk, the, the amount of cases that we got in new applications was incredibly lot lower than what's happened now. And that's partly because of the expansion of the jurisdiction of the court to a more general jurisdiction. And so I think, I mean, there are some statistics, there's some recent articles that have been written showing the, the, the major expansion of, of the, the workload of the court, particularly on leave to appeal applications. Um, and I think that, that the solution really lies to a large extent in relation to leave to appeals and improving and streamlining the process in that regard. I think that the proposals that have been made by the Chief Justice require serious consideration about how, not that we don't need eight judges to decide on leave to appeals. This is relatively unheard of worldwide that so many judges decide on whether or not uh, a, a matter which, which may have no chance of coming to the Constitutional Court gets heard. And that takes out a lot of time from judges, from writing judgments, and from being able to consider and reflect on, on the issues that they've heard and that they are deciding. So I think that that is very important. I think perhaps a team, uh, as I've mentioned, I think we should continue with the Law Clerk Program, which has had a, a tremendous impact on South Africa. Um, uh, 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 but I think also a complement with a team of experienced lawyers as well who are linked to the court as we had in a judicial, recent judicial exchange with, with judges in Canada, as is the case there, I think would assist uh, the court and help us in a way speed up the decision making around uh, new applications. Uh, I think also there's implementation now happening of IT systems, which are are, are, are important. I, I know the Constitutional Court now is implementing case lines, and I think we may see the opportunity for certain new IT possibilities. For instance, like Google Docs. I know when I write collaborative documents with people, we sometimes have a document where you can actually make changes directly, and a lot of people can work on that together. That may also help improve uh, the efficiency of the court in, 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 in advancing judgments. But 
ultimately you have 11 judges. It's very complicated to ensure that everyone's perspective is taken into account in a judgment and that will of necessity take time and to some extent it is also justifiable to take time to ensure that the right result is reached because once the constitutional court has pronounced that is it and there's no other appeal beyond that and so we need to ensure that what comes out of the court is really um, something that is a quality product and gets the law as right as it can be and achieves the most just result as possible. Uh, Sujay, can I follow up on that? Oh, I'm, I'm yes. the first. Commissioner Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yes. Thank you. Uh, uh, Professor Pilches, uh, thank you for the, this answer you've just given. But what exactly is the problem uh, at the Constitutional Court that is resulting in the delay of judgments? Uh, Commissioner Mukhab uh, Tobi, the um, the, the, the as I've mentioned to you, I think the the, the big issue is the relationship between the leave to appeal applications and the um, and, and the judgments of the constitutional court and the time that judges it takes away. So if we have less, if we, for example, on the proposal that there would be three judges uh, no, uh, making solutions. a decision no, uh, in relation. I don't relation. know the, the solutions now. I mean, I know that the solutions have been there because there has been a recent media exchange between law bodies and the chief justice. I want to understand a diagnosis of the problem. What is what actually happens? An application comes in. Why is it not decided timelessly? Uh, uh, Commissioner, w w look, we, we are balancing many things. So let's say you have a hearing the next day. You are the final court of appeal. A matter comes in. You need to give serious attention to both the hearing that is the next day, and then uh, you need to ensure that you fully understand what the issues are in the leave to appeal application. You not only have to understand what the issues are, you need to go and research the law relating it to see whether or not the SCA or the High Court or whichever other court it's come from, whether that law is correct. You then need to prepare a memorandum and then you need to ensure that eight other colleagues agree with what you've said, which of course also is difficult because there are lots of, there may be disagreements as well on that, on, on, the, on the question of whether to grant leave to appeal. And that's just one leave to appeal. We've now got 400 almost, if you think about it, in the, the year. And so therefore you've got these, you're trying to balance on the one hand, the leave to appeal applications that are coming in with at the same time, writing judgments, ha having hearings and, uh, and, and, and ensuring that you engage deeply with the law, as I've said, is required to ensure authoritative, clear, and, and quality judgments from the Constitutional Court. And so I think that um, what we see is that that exponential increase has placed a huge burden on individual judges and that therefore we have to grapple with how to address the, the solution and the institutional solutions that two of which I've, I've suggested. Just for the last one, Chief Justice, and, and what, have, what have you found yourself as a, I'm still trying to get a practical understanding of this. You know, the reason I ask is because you know, I was also asked by Nadel you know, to look at that uh, issue around the appointment of uh, um, additional judges, let's put it like that, to help the concord. But I was still not understanding what exactly is the problem. You see, for instance, in the SCA, uh, they decide a thousand applications for leave to appeal per annum, and they achieve a 96% decision rate. And they give much more judgments the annum than the Constitutional Court does, and within a short space of time. So I was trying to understand, if we are to be constructive, what, where exactly are we going to say the problem is? I mean, from your experience, have you written a, a note? So you, you get an application for leave, you've been allocated, you write a note uh, to other judges. And what happens to it? Where does it get stuck in the system? It's not a question of getting stuck, I think, uh, Commissioner. I think it's a question of having the time to consider properly um, remember, this, as I've mentioned, the Constitutional Court is the final stage. So when you dismiss an application, that is the end of the matter. And so um, one needs to spend uh, and apply one's mind with, with, with great diligence to when one refuses leave to appeal. And as I understand it, the difference between the SCA and the Constitutional Court is that the SCA, the matters are decided in panels of two. Um, and that is that allows for much speedier decision making and it allows things to take place very quickly. 
where you have a panel of at least eight, and of course we, we were sitting last term with 10 judges, so all 10 judges are going to have a say on the matter. Each one of those judges needs to apply their mind to the matter on top of all the additional matters, and of course we, we each ask, are writing our own new apps, plus other judges are writing their own new apps. And so it seems to me that the delay is inevitable uh, when you have a system that is requiring at least eight judges to agree with or dismiss a leave to appeal. And so I think the solution is, as I've suggested, uh, reducing the, 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 the panels and uh, potentially having assistance uh, to the judges um, uh, 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 with, with experienced lawyers who can help um, sift through those issues and do that research that I was talking about so that we make the right decisions and that we hear the matters that must be heard and that are absolute imperatives to hear, uh, but we also don't hear matters that don't deserve to be heard by the Constitutional Court. Thank you. I think uh, Commissioner Nyami was still My on last question. Mm -hmm. Thanks, uh, CJ. The comment by PLA they praise you for your immense uh, contribution to the legal profession, your academic um, um, writing skill and your publication. But they are of the view that you can benefit uh, greatly if you can be given enough time to have an acting instinct as a judge. I'll invite your comment on that. I obviously would benefit, I think, it's a correct comment. I would benefit from judicial experience, and as you develop the the skill of judging, uh, you, that 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 one will learn, and experience is 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 indeed helpful. Um, at the same time, I think there are particular reasons why academics are appointed straight to constitutional courts. Not this is not just an unusual thing in 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 Germany, in Colombia, ar around the world, right? Th and the reason is because academics bring, in a sense, an, a different experience, as I've mentioned, and also perhaps an experience of slightly being outside the system. And so the benefit of having an outsider view coming into the system, I think, can also aid and, and, and provide a fresh perspective and add to the diversity of the experiences around the court. So um, it seems to me that there's no doubt value in experience, but I think uh, the experience that I certainly can bring is a different experience. And I would suggest that the experience of an academic um, is one which has the skills to be able to write judgments, to be able to engage with the deep areas of the law. And I, I have sort of engaged with those, those issues in, in response to other questions. And so I would suggest to you that I would be able to have those technical skills and competence uh, but obviously develop and, and, and broaden out as a judge over, over time. Thank you. Thank you, Professor. Uh, uh, judge Prim Lambo, a follow-up. Thank, thank you very much, Chief Justice. Prof, uh, good afternoon. Afternoon. Um, I just want to follow up on that because uh, it's of interest to me to understand what your view is. You. This is your first judicial appointment, am I correct? Yes, that is correct. Well, do you think it would augur well for yourself as an individual to start at the first instance superior court to apply your trade, to apply your experience and your expertise, then go straight to the top? I, I do think that academics with a certain expertise are best placed in many ways to work at the apex court. And the reason for that is because for some of the reasons I've, I've mentioned to you that um, I, I mentioned before, I haven't mentioned to you, sorry, Commissioner, um, but that the uh, academics bring a expertise of breadth of knowledge from multiple jurisdictions, etc and a depth um, of engagement with topics, and that those are the kinds of things that are needed, particularly at the courts that require, that decide authoritatively, and, and the court that decides authoritatively. And I think here, we can look at both the constitutional jurisdiction of the court, right, of the constitutional court, which is the guardian of constitutional rights 
ensuring the implementation of the constitution. And I think their bringing in expertise from academia is extremely helpful around the underlying value and debates around rights. Um, I, I've read some comments that there are very few uh, constitutional cases that sometimes come before courts in, 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 in some of the lower courts, right? And so, therefore, uh, that expertise wouldn't be as of value, as of much value as it is to the constitutional court. And around the general jurisdiction, the general jurisdiction requires understanding the deeper principles and rules under, underlying um, uh, the law and various other areas of the law, as I've said, partly require an infusing of constitutional understanding into those other areas of the law, but also benefit from the deeper philosophical engagement, uh, deeper comparative experience that an academic can bring. And so I think it is, and that is why I think this is the practice in other jurisdictions as well, that um, academics are perhaps particularly well placed to, um, to engage with the deeper principles of law, um, to engage, not that academics don't do good jobs in other courts, I know many of my colleagues do act in other courts as well, but I think can actually, particularly with an expertise on constitutionalism, and with an engagement with the deeper underlying principles of law can go to the highest court without, uh, without necessarily uh, lacking uh, something which is, which is needed. And I think that that, that, that complements the judges who have been through the system and who fully understand all the elements of the system that their experience has, has indicated. And so for me, it's not about one being better than the other or one or the other, but it's about a, a complementary skill set uh, that that comes in and advances the 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 and the the ju judgments of the court and the, and the substantive values of the court and that is one thing i do want to say as well is i do think one aspect that academics have is a very strong focus on the core issues the core substantive questions and of course to some extent that means there may be a degree of lack on some of the procedural dimensions but I've also experienced to some extent that procedure can in some ways hinder substance. And so I think that that balance between those with deep procedural expertise, understanding all the ways in which those, the courts work. Try and works, be succinct, I, uh, Professor sorry, Pitches, try and be succinct. Um, yeah, I was sorry, I disturbed the CJs who were stopping me. I was going to do the same thing. Um, I had a court which fills the lion's share of the constitutional cases that come to the South African courts. I've appointed, not me, sorry, the minister. I've recommended a number of, I would call them academics for want of a better word, to do work in the division. And the overall comment from them is it has enriched them a lot better to be steeped in the first instance intricacies of litigation, especially constitutional law litigation. Hence, I asked you the question because you seem to lean on the school of thought that says there are academics who are just fit to go straight to the top. And I have heard of some academics that have approached, they haven't said so directly to me, who have not accepted those invitations because they want to go straight to the top. Do you have a comment to that? Judge President Lambo, as I've mentioned, I think there are many academics who will do a wonderful job at different levels of the judicial system and who will also benefit from that as well. Um, at the same time, as I've suggested to you, and I, I don't know if I can take the point much further, but I think that uh, individuals with specialized constitutional expertise who view uh, matters through the prism of the constitution uh, and who have a deep engagement with both the deeper underpinnings of the law and the values of rights in the Constitution um, may well benefit the Constitutional Court. And that also there are different trajectories 
involved as well. That that some academics uh, that 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 there is a trajectory of moving I, through I the judiciary. Sorry, uh, sorry. I don't want you to repeat what you said earlier. Yes. Thank you very much, Chief. Thank you. Thank you. Chief Justice, Thank may, you. I, may I follow up on that, please? Yes. Thank yes, you. Commissioner Pillay. Um, good afternoon, Professor Bolchitz. Good afternoon, Commissioner. Earlier, and, and I thought I misheard you earlier, but I think you've just repeated it now. Um, when you were asked this question around 174.5, uh, and why, in your view, academics are, in your words, best placed um, to assist the Constitutional Court, you raised three factors. Um, you spoke about the range of exposure to other jurisdictions, which I think you particularly have. You spoke about academics engaging with younger people. And you spoke about what you call the depth of engagement. Um, and that's getting into deeper underlying issues. Now, I just want to check, you're not suggesting that the non-academic candidates for this position, including very highly experienced judges, highly experienced practitioners, are not able to meet these three criteria. Commissioner, I think I was trying to underline not to, to indicate what others don't have, but what academics have to bring. Uh, academic expertise is not exactly the same as other forms of expertise. I think that is very important to, to assert. It, it's a different form of expertise. Uh, uh, I could have chosen to go a route of being an attorney or an advocate uh, and be appointed as a judge, potentially, uh, and that would have been a different route of a legal career. An academic career brings with it certain advantages and disadvantages. And no doubt colleagues who have, as we know, we've got very experienced judges, we have very experienced advocates who are before you, and they have incredible expertise and would be incredible appointments to the Constitutional Court. Uh, but they don't have the same expertise as myself. And the key is to distinguish, and that's what I suggested to you, it's distinguishing the difference between the expertise, right? And I think that's, that's what I was trying to grapple with and develop as an argument of what can an academic particularly bring. And that's exactly what I'm probing with you, Professor Bolchit, is this so-called point of distinction. What I'm putting to you is, and you drew it again in your answer earlier uh, to, to J.P. Mlambo, you drew a distinction between what you call deep substantive knowledge and deep procedural knowledge. And what I'm putting to you is that that distinction is illusory. Given the kind of candidates we have before us, we've got highly experienced judges who've practiced in other jurisdictions, um, who've got that deep knowledge of the Constitution. We've got extremely uh, experienced practitioners who have um, experience on the bench and in practice, who clearly have a strong academic background, and therefore also have that deep understanding of the Constitution. So this, this what I'm probing is what you seem to be um, putting forward as a distinguishing factor, which clearly doesn't seem to be the case. I, I disagree with you. I don't think, uh, and, I, and I'm not seeking to, um, to, to, as I say, cast any aspersions on any other candidate. But there is a difference between people who spend their life researching and working on issues around fundamental rights and people who take particular cases, and, and I'm not knocking this expertise, but try and marshal the evidence for their clients as far as possible to deal with, uh, the, uh, to give the best possible case for their client. And I have noticed in the Constitutional Court, um, from my own experience, that now having acted, that there is in fact a lack of depth at times in the submissions that are put forward and uh, a, a, a lack of the ability to engage with those deeper substantive underlying questions that relate to what conception of privacy are you engaging with? What approach towards socioeconomic rights are you dealing with? How, how do you justify some of the elements? The issues remain it, at a particular level of doctrinal engagement. And I'm not saying we have incredibly smart, brilliant people who are, who are also candidates. Their experience differs from people who uh, spend their days working and researching around both comparative law, uh, both uh, the substantive and philosophical dimensions of law, and uh, that I have seen that in my personal experience, that I've had something to give to other colleagues 
and they've had something to give to me. And so I think it's really important to recognize that uh, uh, individuals who there are maybe, and there are some here, brilliant individuals who have written books, for example, as well, and who've spent the time research, and they will perhaps attest to the difference between writing a book and writing a brief before the constitutional, uh, before the constitutional court. There is a difference, and I've tried to capture that uh, through that reference to the depth, to the ability to connect different ideas, to, the de to explore and excavate the underpinning philosophical justifications underlying that, to make connections that you don't necessarily need to make, and perhaps also Perhaps one element is the imagination, the constitutional imagination that an academic can do without working within the four walls of the particular system itself. And I think that's an important distinction that one is working often as an advocate within the system in a lower court, often with the, the precedent that comes down at you, but without having to actually develop and suggest what is the best way in which the law can 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 build, can, can be, be realized. And that's what academics do. They spend, uh, uh, or, or the academics who are similar to me, how do we best give effect to certain of the deeper values of the Constitution in particular areas? I hope uh, I've tried to convince you of, of that. Not necessarily, but let me put my last concern to you, talking about working within the four, four corners um, and working within the rules. You've spent a lot of time today trying to persuade us that your, uh, your, your viewpoint on the core minimum content is in fact the correct one. Uh, but we know that the Constitutional Court has repeatedly indicated that it does not rely on core minimum content, and it does opt for what you call the reasonableness approach. And in a very well, in very well reasons judgments, repeatedly. Um, you, you accept that the die is cast as things stand, um, and that you work within those parameters if you get to the Constitutional Court? I think the answer is a complex one. The first one, and I think that is a big difference, as you've said, is that the role of precedent as a judge is much more powerful. And one can't simply come into a court and overturn a long history of, of, of development uh, because you have a different theory or you think your theory is better. And so I think that respect for precedent is an essential element. And I think, as I said, this is one of the distinguishing features of academia, being able to stand outside the box and actually say, what are the problems with the routes that we've gone down? Uh, and, 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 and academics doing that. But when, then with your hat as a judge, needing to respect the precedent and not overturning and creating continual revolutions in the law. And so there's, there's a balance, right, that's going to be achieved, that, that needs to be achieved. 